Welcome to the first episode of Series 20, everyone. This series, we finally get to sit down with both Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor, two-thirds of Rowan, Rook, and Deckard, to discuss their latest game, Heart. But before we get to that, let's get on with our announcements. First up, we are currently in the middle of a review drive and contest. We have won a Catacon badge or one t-shirt from our store that we will give out to one of the individuals that have left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We're currently sitting at 42 five-star reviews, and if we can get to 50 by the next Character Evolution Cast episode, we will commission a new t-shirt design of the Ghost Shanks to Go characters we created from our Inspectors episode, and offer that design as a reward instead if you don't want, or can't use, the Academicon badge. If we do hit 75 reviews, then we'll add something extra special to the winner, which we'll reveal once we hit the 50 review mark. Remember, these reviews help people find the show easier and allow us to grow. We currently only have one review left in the wings ready to read, but we will get to that once Amelia and I can sit down to record the next cold open together. Thank you again to everyone who's already left us reviews. They truly do warm our hearts whenever we get to read them. I don't have any further things to announce as of right now, so let's go ahead and get on with the show. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor, designers of Heart, a body horror dungeon crawl from Rowan, Rook, and Deckard, which will be kickstarting this month. Welcome, kind of back, also just in general, to Character Creation Cast. We are really excited that you're here. Mm-hmm. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's pretty good. I actually, I'm actually on this time. It's quite I nice. I know. I'm so excited. Uh-huh. <laughs> not catastrophically get- ill at inopportune moments. <laughs> <laughs> so you get you get the uh, the, the uh, what I believe is the correct grant experience, which is when I'm being perpetually undermined by Chris. Yes. Well, which, and also it's I not like two in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Crucial. Yeah, that was that. It, it placed some challenges on my mm-hmm. body the last recording. But yeah, we are we are. It's it's what is it? Four, t- twenty plus. It's it's four twenty. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the weed time. But we're we're stone cold sober. There you go. So all right. Well. Let's uh, let's start by introducing both of you to our audience. Uh, Chris, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any other projects that you are currently involved in? Uh, I'm Chris. I'm now a full-time game designer, and all my projects are heart or spire-related generally. Um, I work with Grant on pretty much all the games we do. Mm-hmm. And what about you, Grant? What do you have going on? Um, I'm currently so uh, again Spire and Heart. Those those are the two big things that we're working on. But I uh, I put out one one page role playing game a month. Uh, Chris is more is generally in more of an advisory capacity, and uh, I'll call up and go, Chris, it doesn't work. And then Chris <laughs> and Chris will be like, Oh, this number should be five rather than four, and then it works. Yes. <laughs> so um, so at, the, at present, I just finished writing a game called The Witch House. Um, which is kind of a prequel to The Witch is Dead, in which you play fluffy little animals who are who are like familiars to a witch. In The Witch House, Ooh. you are half human, half animal, and you're, and you're losing your humanity, and you have to try and kill the witch to escape. It is brutally wow. sad. It's really hard. It's, like, it's, it's almost impossible to win. Hard time. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not sexy battle wizards, I'll give you that. No. Nope. <laughs> it's the opposite of that. <laughs> but it goes comedy, horror, comedy, horror. That's how we have to, that's how we have to run our um, one-page games. I mean, you, you need a balance, right? Yeah. 
I mean, presumably. <laughs> it all averages out. Yeah. We just kind of do what we want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much all day. <laughs> You're not wrong. Nuts. That's awesome. No one can stop you. <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's go ahead and get into this uh we will start by discussing what this game is all about what's in a game so let's start with the obvious uh, we covered spire last fall heart takes place in that same world far below spire and uses the resistance system uh the mechanics for spire so what makes heart a distinct game from spire so <laughs> We we had a lot of thinking in the early days of doing Heart as to whether it would just be like maybe a an addition to Spire or what it could be. And then we looked at it and went, no, we need to completely overhaul the resistance system to try to get what we wanted out of it. We were we were clear that we were gonna use a resistance system, I think. Like yeah. there, there was kind of a mark of pride in that, saying like, can we use this to tell different stories? Like how far to... could we flex this system? Yeah, we wanted to mess around with it. Um, and so that came up, we came up with the idea for for Heart, which is uh, like the radical opposite of Spire. Spire is like a revolutionary game about societal change. And this is more introspective and going down rather than up in, in, in mm. game terms. Mm. Um, and it's, it's very different to Spire, but keeps a couple of the same sort of notes from that game. Yeah. Cool. So what sort of things, we always ask this question, do you need to play this game? Books, dice, people, and a pen. Yes, you need um, you need a, a, your standard set of polyhedrals. So yeah. D four through to oh, you don't need a D twenty. You can leave that one at home. Thank you very much. Swap that for an extra D ten. Yeah, because you'll, you'll need a few D tens. Uh, it runs. Uh, we have a we, we use slightly more dice than we did in Spire. So we, we, we've got the D fours and the D twelves are correct to play. Uh, a pencil and paper, and I think crucially, a willingness to have horrible things happen to your character and enjoy that. Yeah. You really need to get on board with that, otherwise it's going to be a yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Especially like like if the GM decides to go at it hard, there's a uh-huh. uh, there's it, it can get catastrophic very quickly, and that's fun. You know that that, that can be good, mm-hmm. but you have to be ready for that. Yeah, I think you killed half of our table when we played at Gen Con. Yeah, fully half. Yeah, yeah. I mean you killed yourselves. <laughs> okay, I way. didn't. I stayed alive, but that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, did you great. Just, yeah. You, you, I think I think you're the only person to survive with all your limbs on, and you got a third eye. Oh well, that's, um, that's, that's making money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, in a game where everyone was losing fingers and teeth, I did all right. Yeah, <laughs> extra eye, pure bonus. Brilliant. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, so, what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? So, primarily. It's exploring the effects of the unknown on frail human bodies. We were heavily inspired by Annihilation, and we're inspired by House of Leaves, and uh, you're sort of your... Oh, what's his name? Junji Ito, I think? Yeah. The guy who does those horrible mangas. They're nasty. Uh, yeah, them. really gross. But that, that sort of like t- taking something which is familiar and stretching it. Uh, and like, and like, right, re- re- one of the most impressive things about uh, Annihilation for me certainly was the way that it made new things out of uh, out of rebuilding and hacking parts. Uh, so, like, there's a there's a uh, deer with flowers growing out of their antlers, and that's a pretty basic thing. But taking that and like remixing and recombining ideas, so it becomes unsettling and wonderful and beautiful. What was the point? What was the question again? I started talking about deers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, what stories and themes did you oh, explore yeah, yeah, in this game? Yeah, so themes are change, I think. Uh, yeah. The fact that, so uh, while in Spire you are actively pushing for change, in Heart there is, you're trying not to. Uh, you're trying to You're trying to stabilise the world around you. You're trying not to have your body change. You're trying not to um, lose too much of yourself and your essential humanity uh, as you descend into a place which is desires anathema to humanity. You're not you're not supposed to go there. And how and and resisting that change and there's some there's some colonial stuff there as well and talking about like what effect does it have on the colonizers and the colonized and with sort of there's this fantasy ideal of a place which cannot be colonized. And uh like trying to colonize the heart is fundamentally flawed. 
And, and which, we get it's to, the thing of the the land is actively fighting back against you. Hmm. Like it's not just you going down into the depths and something fighting you back. It's it's invading you, like mm. both your mind, your body. It's it's giving you power because it's it, it's kind of this weird benevolent god in a way. Like it, it's trying to help. It's trying to create a reality you might comprehend, but it doesn't understand. It doesn't we, get it. We have three canonical explanations for what the heart is, and they are all correct. Yes, that's yeah. something we try to do throughout all the books. Is we we go like there is no single truth. Like you cannot be wrong in any part of the setting. So we always try and provide more random solutions to problems that people can pick as the one they like. Mm. Um, and one of them is that the, the heart is sentient and just wants to really help. It wants to make a nice place where everyone can live. But unfortunately, it, it, it mainly understands the concept of teeth and intestines. It's got, <laughs> it's got meat, it's got teeth, it's got stone, and it's going to make a beautiful world out of those one room at a time. Oh, no. <laughs> and it just wants the best for you. It just has to change you so you can work properly. Yeah. And there's, and like, there's lots of different ways which you can run the heart, um, which you can run the, the intelligence of the place itself, and you'll tell slightly different stories. But primarily it's about uh, exploration and understanding the self and understanding um, the world around you. And like kind of accepting that, transience and mm. maybe trying to like pick something that's yours and really look after it whether that be like your sanity or even a location in the game you can kind of go well, you know what actually the people here are good despite being a bit iffy they they are ultimately good people i want to keep this i need to i need to protect this mm. um, from change and let them change at their own pace rather than be forced to change mm. very cool this is a new game, obviously, but I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of where this idea came from and, um, you know, like any big revelations that you've maybe had while playtesting it. How did this start? It was Chris's idea. It was. So every, every, every four months we have a, we have a meeting. Uh, the, uh, the, the three mysterious figureheads behind Rowan, Rook, and Deckard, which is me, Chris, and uh, Mary Hamilton. So not that mysterious, I guess. No. We get together <laughs> and we public. plot out. We I've met all of you. You're real people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're genuinely real. Uh, we get together and we plot out what we're going to do over the next four months, what our, what our goals are, like how, how we're going to get ahead as a business. And, and so like we were, we were floundering around trying to write, uh, trying to write effectively a sequel to Spy, which wasn't quite taking. And Chris was like, oh, what if we did OSR? And I was like, oh, yeah, we could do OSR. We could do a sort of dungeon crawl idea in the in the, uh, in the the resistance system. But how would we sell it? And then Chris had the best idea ever, which was... I don't know which idea you're referencing now. I've had oh, just... many good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Every idea I have is pure gold. I need you to narrow this down. Yeah, my, my apologies, Sensei. Uh, it was it was your idea to just set it under Spire. Yeah, so setting it under Spire lets us have essentially free reign that we can mess with, because Spire is such a uh, bizarre is perhaps the wrong word, but a, a mutable setting and a crazy setting. Like there's all sorts of different interacting factions and all sorts of stuff. We can drag that down and push it into in, into a dungeon crawler. And we can look at a story game version of OSR mm. because I, I personally really like OSR games. However, I'm not going to play any of them. They're, <laughs> they're difficult, right? Like I want a nice, <laughs> I want a nice relaxing game. I don't want to oh, look at tables at any worse. point. And so there are, there are games that do that really well. Sure. But we wanted to take the kind of, um, story first abilities from Spire, the ability that goes, you know what? Actually, I already know this place. I've, I've done a cool thing here before. Uh, I'm creating this part of story and put that into a dungeon crawler rather than like you've got 30 feet of movement. You're like, cool, okay, I've been down this massive spiral staircase before. I know what's at the bottom. Mm. Um, and it let us really mess with the kind of basic OSR formula of you turn left, there are now two doors, which do you go through, one is trapped, that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, I think that setting it in the heart and like exploring what the heart is, like the quite early on we came, we we came onto, onto the idea that the heart is intelligent and will try and build a perfect world for you. It just gets it wrong, mm -hmm. or it'll try and give you what you want as you go into it, which is the role of a GM. 
and mm. so we get to like we get to stay within the established fiction of the world but you can have these really weird coincidences and stuff which are obvious story beats but that's just the heart doing it so it gave us quite a lot of freedom it gives gms quite a lot of freedom as well to just to, to be quite blunt and brisk with storytelling like for instance, there's there's one um, place in in Heart that we've detailed called High Rise, and High Rise is a place that has what we've called blanks, which are something the Heart has made to replicate Drow, because it doesn't understand them yet. It just has the memories of people who have been into the Heart to sort of work off of. So it's created how they look, and it's gone. Okay, you go through daily lives. So it's it's using like machine learning to just let these Drow go through their daily lives, so it can experience it. And then try and improve it in certain ways. Like, maybe they, maybe, maybe they flourish with everything on fire. Oh, no. Nope, nope, try don't. again. Let's try that, that one, one again. Work. Reset the simulation, <laughs> as it were, and then let it run again. Um, and you can run the entire game as though, essentially, the, the heart itself is a crazed AI. Mm. Yeah. Trying to make a perfect utopia, but really going about it from like, right, what is oxygen? Do they need it? <laughs> Optional, yes, no? Yes. Um from that base level, or you can have it as this weird malevolent thing that's trying to persecute you for any given number of reasons. Mm. Um, and it let us have a bigger playground to mess about with, honestly. Mm. How much had you defined like what the heart was before you started doing this game? Because Slightly I know that it was much. like a little bit inspire, but not a lot, right? Yeah, we expressly the- had the heart not mapped. Mm-hmm. Chris was really super clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> no point did I ever want the heart map to aspire because it was this kind of threat, like this alien concept, and you could just drop it into any game as the big bad if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. Or instead of like in some games, you're like, well, it was magic. Magic happened. Like, well, it was heart. The heart yeah. did it. Sure. Um, and it, it, yeah, it was about that freedom of it. It was really good. So then, was it tough to like change that for this to kind of take some of that away? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to say for the first four months of production, Chris and I had different ideas of what the heart was. Like radically different, and we yes. hadn't actually communicated properly <laughs> about what it was. And we were just, I, we were writing based yeah. on two entirely different paradigms of what the heart was. Oh. I thought it was a giant endless city, and Chris thought it was a big cave with some buildings in. Yeah. And, and we so have since both. smushed those together. Yeah. Because Chris's, that Chris's of, bits have more caves. Yeah, my bits have more caves. <laughs> um, because because it's so reality warping. You know what? Sure, the answer yeah. is yes. Mm-hmm. If the answer, if you think of something, the answer is yep, yep, it has it. Sure. Part of the frustrations we've had with Spy is we are not hard sci-fi writers. We are not hard no. fantasy writers. We are. We do not like having to show our working or do any research. That sort of thing. Just just sort of like mush ideas together and go go go. Don't look at them too hard. They'll fall over. And people will say, "Oh, but how tall is Spire?" Well, I don't, I don't know. Why does it matter? Seven. How tall do you it's want a, it to be? It's as tall yeah. as it needs. It's, it's as tall as you need it to be. Plus ten percent. Whatever. That's fine. But people like, like, oh, actually, I've done the maths. And no, shut up. You can't. You no, know, it's bad. And so, heart, they can't do the maths anymore. We've like we've removed all <laughs> the Suck bits. It, nerd. Yeah. 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 Get, put this one on your calculator. Completely like got, stymied that entirely. We've got, but we've got extra skies under there. We've got seas. We've got trees that grow with no um, sunlight. We've like, we d- just because because we, we've got we've got this, this sort of loose primordial soup of reality, just making whatever it was. We can put whatever we want down there, and so can you, and so can your players. And that's that's uh, it's quite free. But I think we've had to certainly we've had to explore a little bit about what there is and what there isn't. Because there's, because yeah. like there's, there's certainly uh, like we'll be writing something and we'll be saying, is this spy? This isn't this isn't heart, is it? This is spy. Like the very first, um, if Chris was chatting about high rise, I did this full breakdown of high rise uh, as one of the first things we wrote for the book. Uh, and it's about three three four pages long, and it, it detailed the cult, and it detailed uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a suicide cult there, and the blanks as Chris mentioned earlier, and the buildings, and so I, so I sent it over to Chris. He was like, this is great. It's a spy setting. This is this is just spy what you've written here. There's far too many people. There's far too there's far too much. This needs to be weirder. And so we cut it back and we left more up to the GM. And it's more it's I think it's one of the benefits we've had is understanding that no two hearts are the same. Oh. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Aww, that's nice. <laughs> so well, like, um, we learned from Spire, like everybody described every district in Spire completely differently. Mm-hmm. And we were so happy with that. 
that we wanted to promote it more and give you more tools to mess about with. Like what we do is essentially we write, we write the first third of everything in great detail and then just kind of let the tracks of that railroad buckle outwards and you're on your own. <laughs> you know, it's, it's your minecart right now. Knock yourself out. Yeah. Um, so we give you the prompts and we give you enough structure to let you just run with whatever weird stuff comes into your head. We give you a blank map. And the map has slots on, and it's like, put the things you like and that your players will like in here. And that's what heart looks like for you. And maybe if you come back down in six months, it'll look different. But there's no sort of, this is canonically what's here and what's there. It's all smudged up together. Uh, also, because it's quite hard to map three dimensional space, we found out. Yeah, really hard. <laughs> yeah. But we don't like it's really expensive to like put that in the books and like. <laughs> you need a pop lot up. of pop up. Yeah. yeah. A lot of holograms. <laughs> I would God. buy a pop-up book of Spire, though. You I and everyone else would buy a pop-up book of Spire. <laughs> <laughs> you open Please it and a mile of tower shoots straight out of it. <laughs> but then we'd Just know exactly gross. how tall it was. So. <laughs> Although, I'll, I'll put in a not to scale at the bottom. <laughs> Augmented oh, reality is making a huge hit on, like, where you can put a, a cell phone on a picture, and oh. through the cell phone, the picture oh, yeah. transforms into something you know, completely different and three-dimensional and everything. Mm. And that'd be great if you just put, like, a postage stamp size QR code down your table and you look at it through your phone and then track the phone up, like, miles and miles of city until it starts breaking cloud. <laughs> you know, well, there you go. You wanted a picture of it. <laughs> or or just, just, like, just say you're very close and it just fills the entire screen. <laughs> yeah, there it's you go. It's just a wall. Yeah, it's, just, it's a very big wall. Frustrum calling, mate. There you go. Even, e- <laughs> even easier. Put yourself inside the spot. <laughs> It's a single room. Oh no, you've teleported inside the wall. Oh no. Perhaps. <laughs> 5.99 please. <laughs> awesome. So, uh before we get into character creation, um there are probably some basic terms and concepts that we need to know uh before we get in there. Um and we've got listed stress fallout domains and callings. Um can you tell us a bit about any of those? Let's take let's take these in turn. Okay, uh, I'll go first. Sure. So stress is theoretical damage. Stress is stress is uh, stress is uh, damage, uh, misfortune, bad luck, uh, mind messing. Uh, none of which has a mechanical effect on your character. Think of it like um, stamina rather than wounds. Uh, okay. To copy from a different game of ours, which you haven't read, uh, but but stress uh, stress has no mechanical impact on your character. However, the more of it you accrue, the more likely you are to get fallout, which is so fallout is the is turning the potential of stress into a concrete problem that you now have to face. Yeah. So it'll in, if you take in enough blood stress and you get blood fallout, it could break your leg. Um, if you get enough fortune fallout, so your luck has run out, you can get lost. Um, echo, which is your kind of effect on the heart and the heart's effect on you, like that internal struggle, it can start mutating you. It can start changing the way that you see. But when I say change the way you see, I mean literally how you see changes. Mm-hmm. See through your hair. Yeah. Um, and you can you can have fallout that means, oh, cool, a load of weird people have started following you around because of your great deeds. You've accidentally started a cult. Like that happens to me all the time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's too common. One of um, my favourite things about Fallout is the way that it, it's kind of like reverse advances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, the, in that you're, in inverted commas, rewarding people for playing well by going and getting into trouble. And we wanted all the Fallout to be like, oh, cool! Oh, my arm came off! Rather than, <laughs> oh, minus five, five foot speed. And no one cares. And like everything's that. on the same level with Fallout, as it were. So a broken leg and a cult have similar game weight. They affect different mm. things, but it's not like, oh, you got a cult, that, whatever. We can brush that off. Now, this broken leg I've got a problem with. Mm. Both of them are designed to be as difficult to deal with as the other. Mm. So, there's a, so, so there's social, societal, um, occult, insanity, physical, all of these different fallouts that are treated the same way as losing hit points and your character coming near to death. And some mm. of them give you almost minor bonuses. Most yeah. of them don't. I like the idea, though, that they are related to the bad thing that happened, because I feel like that's that's a thing that always annoys me in games. It's just like you are minus four whatever, yeah. and it's like it doesn't matter why I failed or how I failed, mm. that it's just generic bad thing happens. And that's and like, really frustrating to me narratively, so I really like that it's 
related to what happens and how it happens. And it just like feels yeah. more like consistent or in yeah. line with what's happening. Sure. And that's, that's one of the nice things. One of the things I, I most like about it is that it's not on a random table. It's not like yeah. a hit location chart. It, you choose whatever narratively makes sense at the time. Um, like if you've just essentially suffered blood fallout in quotation marks, but also it was from an icky monster who like spat a load of gunk at you. Well, maybe we could turn that into an echo fallout. Like it suggested that you do blood because of X reasons or whatever, but you can change it. Nobody's yeah, going to stop you. It's entirely between the player and the GM. Yeah, and the whole the, everything from like character creation through to hit points is built up as essentially a dialogue. Everybody has a say, including the player, in how their player get in how their character gets hurt. Yeah, because it's because it's what people want to happen to them. Amelia, you seem to be a, a strong proponent of this, in that you <laughs> you actively love it when things go wrong for your character in the in in a good way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. fun. It's we fun might, to see what happens. Mm-hmm. We might as well reward people for doing it. We might as well encourage them by giving them effectively cool things mm-hmm. that happen when they go wrong. Well, and I think it encourages people even who aren't actively interested in that, people who mm. don't necessarily want to fail, because I've played with those kinds of people before. But I think it encourages them, too, to try and see what happens if it is something, like, cool or interesting or, you know, like, related to what's happening. It feels a lot more gratifying than just, like... Mm bad it's a bit like in dungeons and dragons there's uh chapter seven i think is the spell is the spell chapter and you only get access to that chapter if you play one of the spell casting classes and our fallout chapter is as cool and you only get access to it if you make stupid mistakes mm-hmm. so you have to go and play fast and hard and you'll, and you'll find the fun bits of the book and the thing is we've we, we found people find it kind of addicting in a weird way like, they'll be like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. That's dangerous. And then one of their friends starts, let's just use the example again, accidentally starts a cult. And like, mm. how do I get me some of these fallouts? I want, I want, I want, I want, a I, want I want some of these. These are the business. <laughs> it's like, well, you <laughs> make My a friend stu- has a cult. I want a cult. Yeah. Well, you start making stupid decisions and play risky. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do what I want. Yes, yes, do that. Go, go stick your legs in that radioactive containment cylinder made of teeth. And then maybe you'll get a cult. <laughs> Look, I mean, Thanks my thing is everyone. like it, it's always been like if you put that thing in front of me, I'm gonna go touch it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, why, why else? That? Why else did you put it in the game if mm-hmm. you didn't want me to touch it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly that. Yeah, <laughs> I might as well have stayed home. <laughs> Next up, we've got domains. So domains are uh, kind of a woolly concept, I suppose. But sk- so that we have skills and domains as the two halves of uh, expertises we have in our game. Uh, so skills are things like uh, kill, hunt, uh, evade, mend, basic verbs which you do to try and achieve something. And domains are more areas of expertise or physical locations in the heart. Mm. So occult is a domain and uh, warren is a domain. Inspire, they were all different parts of the city or different organizations. Here they blur the lines a little bit more between what you, between, uh, what you know and where you are but they they bring with them this sort of penumbra of I have the occult domain. Therefore, I, therefore, when I'm in an occult area, I get to I get to have some stage time. I get to roll more dice. I get to be more proficient. And so it's more they're more of a story concern, saying when do you want your character to be to be good rather than precisely what do you know and what don't you know. Yeah, and I mean, as with a lot of rules in our games, they're arguable. Like because mm. Grant, Grant mentioned that skill, that kind of penumbra. They're designed to be fairly woolly. Mm. Like what, what I, one thing I really like in games is going is, is catch going. Well, I don't have electrical repair, but I do have some background as a bomb disposal expert. Yeah, can they I both like, have wires? They both got wires in. Can I do that? I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> well, you can do that. That sounds not? great. Like, <laughs> because if it goes wrong, then we know why, and it's a better story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we create these things with like the domains are areas within the heart. Sure but they also reply to things from those areas or themed or tonally from the, that style. So a cult is, is one of the fairly wide ones, admittedly, because everything's a bit a cult in a way. Mm. Um, but you can, you can apply things to different areas and get something out of it mm. and essentially argue with your GM for coolness, which is always fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last one is callings, which is a fairly huge thing thing honestly mm. um so in spire we had something called durances which was a background essentially like a very short background that gave you a couple little bonuses to certain things you were 
trained in, perhaps unwillingly, perhaps you really went into it with gusto, whatever. Uh, the calling is in, in heart is why you're down in the heart. What's your reason for being in this stupid, deathly place? Um, and we've got things like adventure. You know what? You are just one of those adventuring nut jobs who wants, who's got a sense of ennui and wants to throw themselves into the more of whatever's going. But then there's things like enlightenment, um, penitence. You've you've committed a crime and you've had to flee down here, and you're trying to make up for that wrong. Um, uh, you could be forced down here, like people. Somebody's got blackmail on you and wants you to to go down here and get something for them. And they all contain something called beats, which are little story seeds that you complete to, to advance your character. Um, and they're, they're a bigger part of character creation than they were uh, in Spire. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, I thought they were super neat. It's pretty, it's pretty fun, like the way that in Spire you advance your character by changing the city. And that really worked for the, for the game that Spire was doing because it was very broad. It was quite a wide game. And because this is much more focused, this is basically a bottle episode that lasts for, for the whole campaign in that you're trapped in the heart, as it were. You're trapped together. And so saying, all right, when you do this scene, when you achieve this thing, you get to, you get to advance. And some of those are take, take major blood fallout. So you'll find people pushing themselves into really stupid situations so they can get hurt, so they can level up. And, all right, cool, then the game happened. You know what was trying. <laughs> or even, like, one of, one of my personal favourites is you, you you meet and deal with an NPC who hates you. Mm. Like, we're not talking a combat thing. This is a social thing. And this person just despises you. And with good reason. Yeah. And it's really nice to see a player go, oh, oh, that NPC, can that be the person that hates me? Yes, it can. <laughs> Yes, yes it definitely can. <laughs> um, and it's, it's so much fun having people just throw like scenes at you as a GM. Like, oh, we, we've got a quiet bit here. Can this be the bit where I fall down a terrible dark hole? Well, yeah. sure. <laughs> it's your birthday. <laughs> I'll allow it. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other terms or anything that you think people might need to know before we jump into actually building our characters? Mastery is a term which will come up. Yes. Oh, yes. Mastery means you roll an extra d10 when you do the thing. That's all. <laughs> so, 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 Basically. Um, yeah. Well put. You roll an extra d10, but uh, we need, but, but you can only, you, there's a cap on mastery and there isn't a cap on the word d10. That's fair. But aside from that, no. No, we should okay. be fine. We, we, can, we can go through. Thankfully, it's a know. fairly simple character creation system. The yeah, problem quick too. The problem is choice rather than anything else. Yeah, I'm real bad at choices. <laughs> yeah, I get it myself. The option paralysis really sinks in. Yeah. All right. Well, are we ready to make some people? We can make some Let's people. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. All right. So what's the first thing that we need to do to create a character in this game? Good question. <laughs> I actually wrote this out today just oh, to well, make sure that I had exactly what you need to do. Um, <laughs> we've put we put it in it's in the playtest um, and it'll be a lot a lot clearer in the the final version. Um, but the first thing you need to do is essentially kind of pick a vague concept for what you want to do. Um, like, do you want to be somebody who throws about weird? Well, I say throws about. This isn't fireball, but who interacts with weird magics. Do you want to be slightly more mundane in a difficult world? That sort of stuff. Once you've kind of got that idea, the next thing to do is to pick uh, a race. Um, and races have absolutely no mechanical benefits at all in this game. Um, so there's a couple of people of NPCs who might look at you a bit differently if they came from Spire, which was a very segregated game. Mm. Um, but down here, everybody's in hell. <laughs> like... <laughs> Who's going to be mean to you because you're a null in this world when the literal chairs are trying to eat you? Mm. Um, so you've got humans who are kind of gnomes. Like, they're enterprising, they're archaeologists, they're inventors. Tech-focused, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got drow, who we saw a lot of in Spire, um, and are honestly the most common down here yeah, because it's their city. They're people. Yeah. Like, they are the default. Yes, they are, they are definitely the default. Uh, you've got the Elphir, who previously were unplayable in Spire because they were awful oppressors. Mm. And we don't want people playing awful oppressors. Um, but down here, most of them are as bad off as everybody else. Mm. They're, they're, they're not part of the society, which they've been exiled from. Yeah, like a lot of them are unmasked, which if you've seen Spire is just like the biggest social transgression ever. Um, and you can play as Nolls. 
who are Ooh. lovely wolf boys. <laughs> <laughs> Big um, dog boys. Yep. Um, and it's it's kind of nice to know what sort of culture you're coming from. Like the playtest document doesn't have anything on this because it's not mechanical, so we skipped it, honestly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we needed to cut to the, the quick of what we were testing, um, but the full book will have a bit more of this. Mm. Um, so, for instance, if you're picking a knoll, they're they're very good at things like demonology. They've got their they've got their claws in many weird types of magics. Um, yeah. But if in doubt, the easiest thing to do is just assume drow. Mm-hmm. Slap, slap a French name on it. Change a couple of letters. Bob's your uncle. Yeah. So um, the next thing you do, I think, is you pick your class and then your calling, Chris. Either way around, you want to do it. Yeah, either way around. Uh, so what I'd recommend you do is take a look through the uh, through the callings. In fact, yeah, take a look through the callings first. So the first in the first in the document. So we've got there's adventure, there's enlightenment, there's forced, there's penitent, and there's heart song. Um, all of those, aside from heart song, make sense just from the word. Uh, heart song is when you sleep, you dream of the heart. So you get to be that weird sort of. Oh, I've heard, I've heard whisperings in the undersea. There, there are eyes that look upon us from below. You get to do all sort, of, all, all that if you want to, uh, and be rewarded for being weird and being part of the city. Um, take a look through those, see what beats there are, see what you're excited about doing, and then take a look at the classes. Should, should, we, should we run through the classes in turn, Chris? Because at a moment, there's uh, there's six. Uh, yeah. There'll be more in the final game. But, um, well, yeah, we'll go through them in turn. So the first up is the Heretic. Heretic is a uh, very <laughs> religious, absurdly religious person who's been exiled from the city above, uh, or like their great-great-grandparents were, and they're still sort of bitter about it. Uh, but they worship the moon beneath, which is... Uh, you all played Bloodborne? Nope. That, that would have been really easy. Well, don't worry. It, <laughs> for, for anybody it, listening, it, 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 hang on, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. It's a completely original idea that oh, we yeah. came up with ourselves. We're smarter wow. than them. We and it's super cool because that's what I played. <laughs> we didn't just nick it from Bloodborne. Uh, um, <laughs> one of the cool things that I really like about Bloodborne, um, the the PS PS4 game, is that it's about humans coming up against Cthulhu style massive intelligences and then everything going wrong for them. And like their bodies and minds warping and changing. And so we just put that into a class nice. called the Heretic. Yeah, just let players uh, embrace it rather than it be a problem. Yeah. Uh, so like their their most iconic ability is communion, uh, which you just you open a tiny little uh, channel to the goddess in your mind, and then everyone who can hear you speak in tongues takes damage. Oh. That sort of thing. Including your party, I feel I should yeah. stress there. They can plug their ears with wax. That's their problem. Yeah. Um the next, next up, we've got the Hound. Chris, tell us about the Hounds. So when the Heart was kind of first discovered, the Alphair sent down an enormous military unit to kind of essentially go, well, more land, hooray, we'll take it for the Spire. Um, that got messed up real quick. Um, and the Hounds are the splintered factions that kind of came from that original unit getting destroyed. And they've placed themselves as watchmen of the, of the Heart. So they've, they're an informal police force. I feel I should say there is no single book of rules or laws here. And, and one way you can make a hound is to kill a man who's got a badge, take the badge, and then pretend to be a hound. That's You're perfectly legitimate. Yes, you are a perfectly, perfectly um, cromulent hound. Well, I feel like if you defeat somebody in combat, you assume their position. Well, Isn't that just how, how that works? works? Yeah. That's how I got this job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so they, they enforce what they consider the laws. Um, the problem is that none of them agree. Yeah. So they just enforce whatever they feel is just and right, which, as you can imagine, is a sliding scale. Mm. Very, very heavily um, inspired by Vimes from uh, from Discworld and every film Ray Winston has been in. Yep. If you imagine uh, he's a, Ray oh, Winston yeah. in a World War One trench fighter. Do you role. know who Ray Winston is, Americans? I am not, not the person f- to ask about anything. Okay. <laughs> Ray Winston, he's like he's like a chestnut crossed with a testicle. <laughs> and he talks like this. He's no nonsense. Imagine a square London gangster from films. <laughs> That's Ray Winston. Yeah. And then put him in a World War One trench. A World War yes. One trench and give him a badge. <laughs> now transport that trench to hell. And okay. that's the stuff. <laughs> really, really basic ideas. Yeah, just like whatever. 
the next class we've got is the Junk Mage. Oh, the Junk Mage. The Junk Mage. Um, honestly, I think it's both of our favourite, isn't it? Not quite. Not quite. Um, we were we wanted to have a wizard class. We wanted to try and work out what they were doing. We had them as hackers for a while. But what we've got them now is the Junk Mage is someone who is basically siphoning power off from something far more powerful than they are. Yeah. So like a warlock, except they're breaking in. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they, they are, they're like they've got they've got the the hose pipe up and they're they're, they're sucking gas out of a, <laughs> a, out of a, a, a Demolich's brain. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's a warlock with a patron who hates them, <laughs> and yeah. they are chemically addicted to the power that they can get from that patron, which yeah. is fun. Um, so we we got to then we, we we got to invent all this huge larger than life imagery around all the supernatural patrons, then just sort of put it somewhere where the players can't go. Except mm-hmm. if you play a junk mage, then you can sort of plug your mind into it. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, at present, we've got rules for um, basically earth, uh, fire, and water, but we've dressed it up with some fancy words. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not You're like giving it. away all the secrets here. <laughs> knights, Chris. So yeah, the Vermissian knights are uh, probably the best way of explaining them is tanks mm. in the in the classical like trinity of role playing games, like fighter, tank, healer. Uh, but also literal tanks, like the military style. Um, they are the defenders and explorers of a cursed train network that caused the whole heart problem in the beginning. Um, it's a it's a spire plot line essentially, where they built they tried to build a mass transit network and thought, well, we'll plug it into this un- otherworldly reality to, to give it some power <laughs> because we're terribly bright. Um, and it went horribly wrong, as you can imagine. And the Missing Knights are the uh, are the uh, the armed forces of those people. So they wear reclaimed armor built from old train carriages. Like they can wield a train door as their only weapon. Um, and they can jack into like this uh, transit network. They can shortcut distances. They can um, etherically charge their armor so that it's massively conductive so that when somebody hits them, it feels like a train's hit them. Um, they're an odd class and they are yeah. genuinely a joy to see people play because what we've done is we've given one class the ability to run headlong into danger and live. And, yeah, and explode, but they survive. Um, and it's it's hilarious watching them like pinball their way through different hell dimensions, <laughs> seeing what trouble they can get into. Fifth class we've got is the witch. Uh, the witch is uh, an evolution of the blood witch from Spire. So we've taken the idea of people who were infected basically with magic, uh, which lets them control blood and control space and time, and then put them in their element. So we want to talk a little bit more about, about culture and about how people react to uh, to wise people, to people, with, to people who understand things in an environment where understanding can be seen as a threat. Uh, so they're kind of half fey, half nobility, uh, half witch, uh, and they can pull gallons of blood out your nose if they don't like you. <laughs> and frequently do. And frequently do. And then the final class we've got, which were, which was not in the playtest, but was just, was still working on, is the Incarnadine. Yeah, Ooh. so in Spire we had the Azurites, uh, who had a god of, of greed and plenty and wealth. Um, and there's actually a, a flip side of that coin, which is the god, the god Incarn, who is the god of debt. Um, and these, the Incarnadine has gotten themselves into so much karmic debt from buying and selling everything from, like, let's say, weapons to people's memories mm. um, that Incarn has essentially claimed them as their own. Um, and you can do a lot of very strange uh, bartering systems in the game to, like, go, well, I could take this damage or you could take this damage for me and I'll owe you a quit. <laughs> <laughs> Are these the ones that have like a bomb in their head? Yes. Yes. And then yes, this is what Dylan played. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Yes, they, they they a lot of them have essentially dead man switches so when deals go bad, uh, oh. which essentially detonates them. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um <laughs> it can become a problem. It's fun. This it is, is fun. a very happy game. Yeah. 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 Like, it's great. Yeah. You know, you know it is it is it's deliberately fairly grim. And players can make their own jokes, and there's always the grim to come back to. Mm-hmm. People are going to make jokes. People are going to want to want to release that tension, and there's there's an the absurdity about about what's going on. Like it's so unpleasant. Why on earth are we doing this? And <laughs> like one of the great things about body horror is it's pretty much always unpleasant. 
Mm-hmm. So you can just you can just sort of like you can you can keep going back to that well after everyone's making jokes and you just go oh cool a, a, a rose made out of bone blossoms from from one of your eyes and restore your tone and like a lot of nice. that is that the, it's so absurd mm. like in a lot of cases it's just bonkers what's going on and in, in in the game that we were playing with Amelia um someone's arm grew legs and ran off. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> you turned into like a giant spider thing, and then one of his legs fell off. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. And it's it ran away from him. But like, you yeah. can use that to break that awful tension of everything is dire. This is a nightmare, and then mm-hmm. one of your arms scuttles off. You're like, well, I, there's literally no way I can't laugh at that. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I'm not even mad. Yeah, like that's that's funny, and then you can come back to the and make it as gritty and dark as you want, or you can probably shift the lever towards levity yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think we had we had a casino thing that was like you were paying in your memories and it was it was dark but then also like it was really fun because also you could pay with teeth and that (laughs) was just fun (laughs) and you you were basically the overworked middle management and janitorial staff oh yeah (laughs) of of an infinite (laughs) casino yeah it was good yeah it was fun Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like Modifier. Modifier is an interview show hosted by Megan Dornbrock, all about why and how people change games. From the hobbyist to the professional, from house rules to publication, we all have in mind a better way to play. What's yours?